Hello and welcome back to the Spike Podcast. I'm Lauren Smith, sitting in for Fraser this week. And joining me on today's episode is Tom Slater, editor of Spiked. Hello. And Ella Whelan, a Spike columnist. Hi. On this week's episode, we'll be discussing the desperate downplaying of Hamas's crimes, the fallout of the Dublin riots, and the witch hunting of Rosie Duffield. So, unfortunately, we have to talk again this week about this phenomena of um, atrocity denial, of this kind of desperate jump to downplay or outright deny, even in some places, the crimes that Hamas committed uh, against Israel on the 7th of October. And this is really sort of blown up again this week, mostly because of a reaction video that was put out by a Guardian columnist, Owen Jones. And essentially, this video, um, he talks us through his takes on the footage that was released by the Israeli government documenting the crimes of Hamas. And Owen Jones doesn't deny the atrocities, um, but he does demand more proof, specifically of the motivations and intentionality of Hamas. You know, he admits, okay, sure, uh, we can see the corpses of women, but how can we know that they were raped. And, you know, we can see the bodies of the children that were killed, but how do we know that they were killed intentionally? So, Tom, what is the deal with people like Owen Jones? Are they just asking questions, as they say, or is there something more sinister about this? I think if you want an insight into how much the um, pro-Palestine left have lost the moral plot, lost their moral bearings, you you do worse than watching that 20-minute video. It's incredible to watch someone recount the horrendous things that he's seen which, as you say, he doesn't flat out deny. He doesn't say that Hamas didn't commit war crimes. He accepts that from the off. He also talks about how distressing it was to view. Of course it was. But he then kind of goes through it in this bizarre, pedantic fashion as to what he's willing to believe more he isn't. So cases of, we didn't see anyone being sexually assaulted, so we can't confirm that. There was a woman whose child remains was found without any underwear on, but obviously that's not proof. You do see a couple of young boys being severely maimed in a grenade attack, but we don't actually see any young boys being killed. You get to the point about what is going to be good enough for you, Owen. There was one actually a sort of satirical, jokey send-up that was put on the internet where someone imagined him going to Israel and demanding that the coffins were opened for him to try and prove what it is that exactly happened. This is morally questionable, I think. It's worth saying that the denialism of the October the 7th pogrom gets a lot worse than Owen Jones. Um, as we say, he doesn't flat out deny that it happens. He's just constantly asking for more and more evidence, the extent to which um, one wonders what would actually satisfy him. There are people who are openly saying it was a matter of false flags and actors and all sorts of other horrendous things. But um, there is also this layer of people who, whether wittingly or unwittingly, in their alleged pursuit of just journalistic good practice, are feeding a dynamic which is trying to downplay the full extent of what happened. Uh, You often see it with an obsession with the extremities of the cases. So you can say, yes, all these people were slaughtered, including women and children and so on, but there's this 40 dead babies claim. So they obsess about that. And if they're not presented with ample dot and comma evidence, then therefore it starts, you cannot help watching someone engage in that kind of discussion to feel like they're feeding something, which is to try and downplay just the full extent of it, if nothing else, or to question the full extent of it. And I think it's incredibly um, unpleasant to watch. um, And whilst I know what he thinks he's doing with it, I know he, he claims that all he's talking about is just journalistic good practice. He is wittingly or unwittingly feeding a tendency which has been very present on what you might roughly call his side of the debate to say in a way that would be very reminiscent of um, earlier denialist movements, yes, it was terrible, but it's not as bad as they're saying, is it? And whilst Owen Jones is by no means the worst of this, I think the generous interpretation of what he and others like him have been doing is that they're useful idiots. They're still feeding that dynamic, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we've even had sort of the hostages been brought into this now, trying to be used as evidence that, you know, maybe Hamas aren't that bad of a group after all. Maybe there are some redeeming qualities about them because, you know, you've had people saying, look at the way that um, the released hostages have responded to their captors. They've kind of been seen um, giving them maybe what could be a smile or shaking hands with them. And that's being used as proof that what happened on the 7th of October wasn't that bad. And Ella, what do you make of this? Like, what is going through these people's heads that makes them so blind to the evidence that is being presented in front of them, sort of getting lost in the weeds of 
Maybe one hostage smiled, but you know, they were still hostages. They were still taken hostage. There were civilians that were taken from their families. You know, what why are people so blind to this? Well, I think there's something particularly dark about the picking apart of the, those videos as sort of a um, camera light flashing into the car, watching the hostages being put in by, you can see um, Hamas fighters with the green headbands. And, you know, unless you've been in that situation, how would anyone know how they would react? Are they expressed, you know, are, did they make friends with the captors? Are they expressing a kind of relief that thank God the ordeal is all? Who knows? You know, what kind of extreme mental state you would have had to have been in to have been held hostage um, for 50 days at that point, knowing what happened to your fellow people in the kibbutz you were in and have seen the kind of things you would have seen. I mean, it's just the lack of humanity to to sort of um, use that as a means to bash the IDF is basically what's happening, is to say, ah, it's really just a sort of Netanyahu uh, propaganda campaign. Israel's, you know, on social media, there's lots of people saying, if you look at the state in which the Palestinian detainees have been, you know, released from jail in and the nice clothes that the um, people who have been hostages of, of Hamas um, are wearing, you know, who are the real victims and who are the real evil people? It's just, it's just extremely unpleasant. Um, it's stomach turning. But I think the, you know, what's happening in relation to the sort of desire to um, pick apart evidence on social media. I mean, I think Spike would be, we have a long history of being, um, you know, and as most journalists would, of having a healthy amount of skepticism and always thinking about where is the evidence, what's the sort of angle for what anyone's pushing. But, you know, you, there is a real double standard here. If you think about, even in relation to the, the you know, what's seen to be the rape of these women, um, I mean, in the discussion around Me Too or whatever, you know, the believe the victim mentality, yeah. obviously we criticise that because it led, it can lead down a dangerous road. But there's, there's no, there's no believe the dead victims mentality for these um, murdered Jewish women. And there's just, the, the, I think it's the tenor of the unpicking and the picking apart that makes me shudder because there's nothing in the abstract wrong with questioning anything that comes out, particularly anything that comes out of a government or an army in the middle of a war, because obviously messaging is very important. And, you know, Israel is not unique to any other country that would, you know, want to put out a particular kind of message. But I don't understand what these people think giving this footage over to the BBC or giving it over to the whatever, Guardian or whoever, would do. What what extra do you need to see having gone to that screening and watched it? Um, there, I think that there's there's only one conclusion that people can come to, which is that there is a special kind of forensic laser focus put on things that have come out of Israel. And that's not because the uh, IDF has a greater or lesser track record of lying or spinning than any other nation, but because there is this sort of, you know, David Baddiel style, David Baddiel calls it Jews don't count mentality, which is just that it can't be true if it's coming from the IDF. It can't be true because the Palestinians are the oppressed and Israel is the oppressors. And that kind of, I think, just that sort of narcissistic inability to um, to grapple with what is actually happening and the complexities of what is happening. And actually to be able to, I think the reason why I use narcissism is because I think there's a lot of you know, my fellow lefties who really want this to be a really clear goodies and baddies battle. Like maybe, it, you know, they really want it to be the 1960s and they really want to be able to say that, absolutely all Palestinians and everyone on that side is, you know, angels to be saved and everyone in Israel is terrible. And it's obviously a far, far more complicated situation. And the fact that they can't update their moral framework to contend with a anti-Semitic death cult that has in its covenant the desire to wipe out the Jewish race, um, you got to just, it just makes you shudder, actually. And there's people who are trying to do the goodies and baddies thing. There's also people trying to do the moral equivalence thing, which I think is mm. as disturbing. I mean, you saw that around the discussion of the hostages. So during the hostage swaps, you know, they would, you would see reported on the news or discussed about how there were these Israeli women and children who are being released, and then there is these Palestinian women and children. Now, first of all, many of the women who were released had done things like stabbed people <laughs> in the midst of 
terrorist attacks. Uh, the children, most of them were older teenage boys who'd also been involved in things of this nature. On the other side, you're talking about, in many cases, young children. Babies. Uh, mm. Babies in some instances, although unfortunately we've heard that the youngest hostage, um, according to Hamas, didn't make it. Um, complete innocence. Many of them left-wing peace activists who live in the south of the country. So the attempt to kind of suggest, well, even the, the moral equivalents I find incredibly disturbing. And the hostages thing was really quite striking because of the fact that you had a bizarre willingness to believe on the part of these um, supposedly pro-Palestine people that they were treated so well. First of all, these people have been taken as hostage and kept underground at gunpoint. The idea that they're going to come away from that thinking it was actually quite a nice break. And, uh, you know, I got, they, they're actually quite a nice guy. It's absurd when you think about it for 30 seconds. One of the videos that was doing the rounds was a young woman who, again, some idiot says, I'm not a body language expert, mm. but this doesn't seem to me to be someone who um, is that fearful of their captors. The community note then pops up and it points out that this young woman was shot <laughs> before she was kidnapped. So the idea that, again, after all of her de- weeks in captivity, mm-hmm. having suffered that horrendous injury, she's going to be like, well, you know, we play table tennis. It's actually fine. It's just, it's absurd on the face of it, but it um, it keeps coming out. And I think part of that as well is the willingness to um, buy into a lot of her mass propaganda. There's constant talk about the idea that the IDF are kind of warping the information space by putting out bullshit, et cetera, et cetera. But if you think about the way in which it's been quite clear that Hamas have tried to, again, sort of present this happy hostages image from time to time. Also the way in which they've often released some members of a family, but not all of them. So therefore, when these people get interviewed by the press, they cannot say anything about their experience because mm. they're terrified about their relatives or they're also probably just worried and may have been advised even by the Israeli authorities it's best to keep them because of the fate of the rest of the hostages. So, and not to go back to Owen Jones because one doesn't want to spend all your time talking about him, but that was one thing that was interesting about that video, the remarkable scepticism give me evidence for every single thing that was claimed and seen and so on. And then he'll just casually refer to, say, the death figures that the Hamas Run Health Authority yeah. will give and take that as read. That imbalance is interesting, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, it's the moral equivalence, but also it's the disparity in who is believed and who isn't when the anti-Semitic terroristic monsters in the piece are apparently almost uh, more credible in the eyes of some of these people. I, I think that imbalance has been striking and it's not, you know... Even on listening to the Today program, Radio 4, you know, they, at the beginning of the, when the war broke out, they would refer to authorities in Gaza. Mm-hmm. And you're like, okay, what? Hamas then, right? Yeah. You know, who, what? Do you have some independent body that's, you know, in the middle of Gaza able to give you reliable information? Or are you taking the words of, a, you know, a terrorist group which, has a vested interest in portraying as you know as much as you think Israel might have a vested interest in portraying a certain message. I mean, my God, a terrorist organization is not going to be, from my point of view, the most truthful of um, and the most re- you know reliable of sources. But there has been, I think, this is the thing that a lot of people who have been following this war and who might be, you know, as, as I do, have some concerns with the consequences of what's going to happen for you know, instability in the region. And you know, the idea that if you can't completely wipe out Hamas because there's a new generation of people ending up in refugee camps who are going to be more aggrieved than their parents and all the rest of it. And you might think, I want to, you know, I want to voice some of this. And maybe you think you want to, you know, you're looking at this footage or you want to go on a march. But I think the reason why most decent people decide that they can't is because there is just this resounding silence of any kind of scrutiny or any criticism of Hamas. The discussion about what's happening in um, between Israel and Hamas is, you know, uh, just the world's uh, criticism and scrutiny on this nation, which has and people who have just been butchered. And it sometimes feels like just a free pass mm. for the other side. And I think that we have to keep drawing attention to that and saying that this conflict, um, you know, has got a long history. You could say it's complicated in terms of that's history. But what happens since October the 7th isn't complicated. It's very clear um, which side you should be on. And that's not on the side of a uh, anti-Jewish death cult. So, of course, the other big news this week is coming out of um, Ireland. We saw um, last week some pretty dramatic and chaotic scenes of rioting happening in Dublin. This erupted uh, towards the end of last week after 
a stabbing of four people, that's three children and a woman outside of primary school in the city. And it later emerged that the suspected knifeman was of Algerian origin. It's a little tricky because he is a naturalized Irish citizen. He's been living in the country for 20 odd years. But for a lot of people, that was a kind of tipping point. Um, and it became a sort of outpouring of anger towards the uh, Irish immigration policy. A lot of people that felt like they hadn't been listened to. And we saw scenes of you know, people setting cars and trams and buses on fire. Um, there was a lot of looting, smashing up shop fronts, um, a lot of also some very nasty anti-immigrant sentiment um, and outright criminality. But the way that these riots were portrayed were, by the Irish elite that is, is sort of this, we, you know, we don't know where this is coming from. We don't know why this is happening. This is just, you know, stoked up by the far right ideology sort of being orchestrated. And we can't imagine why people feel this way. But um, Ella, it's not, there's more to it than this, isn't it? It's not just far right hatred. It's, um, a, you know, it's an expression of something that is something very deeply wrong in Irish society at the minute. The thing that has been very frustrating about what happened in Dublin is that conversation has moved very swiftly on from the stabbing of three under seven year olds. It's a, a remarkable event um, and, a, and a care assistant from the school. Um, that's kind of just been shelved to a discussion about uh, what what sort of didn't happen, about a sort of misinformation row, actually, really, which is that, you know, Dublin might be a capital city, but it's a, but it's a relatively small town in terms of word travels fast. And people who had seen this attack, which happened in, you know, the centre of Dublin, very public, you know, about 10 minutes walk from some of the busiest shopping streets, you know, the person who, the alleged suspect of what was seen was clearly not, your, you know, your average Mickey O'Reilly. It was someone who we now know is from Algerian descent. And that information spread informally throughout people. But the 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 messaging from the Gardaí, the Irish police and the Irish government and was reported in the Irish Times was simply this was a, the suspect is an individual of naturalized Irish, whatever the language, but basically saying, don't you dare make this about an immigration issue. That was the sort of messaging, which was don't go there. Um, and that is, if you know anything about the sort of what's happened recently in Ireland in relation to other um, murders, like the murder of Ashley Murphy, or, um, you know, some of the sort of quite tense rows around immigration was pretty clearly going to lead to something which it did, which was something rather ugly. Um, and, you know, you have in Dublin, a, you know, section of society, which is, you know, still particularly poor, um, is very on edge and pissed off about the kind of way in which the Dublin elite and particularly the Dublin media class just sort of sideline their, the issues that they care about. Say there's nothing to see here about immigration. There's nothing, even though, as Brendan O'Neill points out in his spike piece, um, that, you know, rates of immigration in Ireland are, you know, pretty astronomical, whether you're liberal or not, the figures are pretty stunning. Um that 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 kind of tension boiled over, and there were quite a few. There are quite a few far right um, sort of social media agitators who piled on and said things like, "Come on, bally up, tool up, let's go and you know crack some heads." And that happens in situations like this. But the narrative that there was this kind of organised far right in Ireland that simply had decided it was going to take an opportunity to burn a few Lewis trams and nick a few runners from um, Foot Locker. Is is just a it's it's a total misunderstanding of what's happening, and I think the biggest issue is that I wouldn't really want to be an immigrant in Ireland at the moment now because I think that there the mishandling of events like this and the oppressively censorious way in which they're reported ends up driving discussions underground and you do end up have with a bit of a rise of anti-immigrant sentiment. I mean, there are rows being had all over the country. I know from where my family's from, um, which I think is a product of people feeling like they can't talk about the fact that their local sports center has been given over to housing for refugees or whatever it is. And that can turn ugly. So I think we're in, it's very tense in the moment in Ireland. Most people have no truck with far right agitators. They, you know, people, they're proud of saying we, you know, welcome open arms to immigrants and all the rest of it. That's all true. But 
this this kind of tact that the Irish government is taking and um, commentators like Fintan O'Toole of just sort of saying, la, 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 nothing to see here, don't talk about it, is classic sort of Irish repression, which they learned from, you know, w- previous regimes. But the it's, it's not going to end well. It's, it's pretty depressing, actually. Hmm. It was interesting as well, the parallels with the um, Nosley mm. riots that we saw yeah. not too long ago in uh, Merseyside, where you've got a combination of, um, essentially you have kind of horrendous scenes which make the news. So you've got, um, in that case again, People, again, I can't remember if they were throwing petrol bombs, but there were certainly flames in the air. And you had a similar situation where you had um, originally kind of a very organic um, protest or expression of concern happening, which then gets hopped upon by opportunists, whether that's opportunists on the far right or opportunists, um, young lads who want to go and stir up trouble and smash stuff up. Um, and then that becomes the pretext to ignore the thing that prompted it in the first place. And you see that playing out exactly here. Also, certainly the social conditions seem to be relatively similar. So um, Nosley was, um, is I think, the third most deprived local authority in Britain. And this is the thing that happens across the piece in relation to the UK and where asylum seekers tend to be housed in hotels, which I know is a phenomenon in Ireland as well, where um, the the burden falls disproportionately on some of the poorest areas in the country. So you stick that on top of it. You also stick on top of it the fact that, um, particularly when you have a situation where security controls in relation to something like asylum seekers are relatively lax, sometimes there are problems that arise from that. Um, in Nosley, there was a um, video doing the rounds of a um, man propositioning a young girl, for instance. And then rather than actually take any of that seriously, look into it, <laughs> you know, try to explore what actually might have happened, you just get it being reflexively pushed back by the media, by the powers that be as far-right misinformation and so on. So you're creating a powder keg in this situation where you have some legitimate concerns, uh, um, questions around security, public safety, also questions around resources. You've got people who are really feeling the pinch at the moment, and yet um, they look at, say, the local hotel, which um, which used to be used for weddings and people used to work in, is now just given over to being um, accommodation for people who are claiming asylum. And then when they try and raise any of these things, they don't get any responses. You're pushing people towards having to express that via other means. Now, that's not to say that um, rioting is legitimate. I also don't think that it's as simple an equation of someone isn't listened to and then they go and torture a bus. These are opportunists who move in in the midst of a uh, hairy situation, as it were. But it's so starkly clear that rather than address the concerns that people are raising, which have a lot to do with not necessarily migration or refugees entering the country per se, but certainly how that's being dealt with, how people are being integrated or not, how the general public are being brought along with this discussion rather than just being shut out of it and given no control over it whatsoever. Uh, it's a transparent ap- attempt to just completely downplay it. And actually worse in in the, um, certainly in the post-Dublin right situation where it's now being used as a pretext to push through all these hate crime laws as well, as you say, kind of further saying, shut up about it. Yeah. Otherwise, no, you can just see the glee. being locked up. Or <laughs> yeah, you can see the glee. Um, Michal Martin, you know, announced that the, that this hate crime legislation, which has been extremely controversial and has been in, uh, you know, in the works for a long time, um, but has been a bit sluggish getting through the Irish government. And now he said, you know, absolutely, we're going to have this on the statute books by Christmas. Um, it's just, it's like the perfect opportunity, the green light. Now, here we go. Now we can put in this kind of legislation, which is, is you know, this horrendously circular uh, sort of Kafkaesque legislation, which says that a hate crime is... It, described as anything that causes hate. So it's, you know, you cannot put your finger on what it would mean. Um, actually, in kind of classic Irish form, they have this sort of, there's so much double meanings in it. They have a line in it which says, you are allowed to be offensive. But then the next line says, you um, anything that incites hate is is um, illegal. I mean, obviously, I'm not sure what would be offensive and wouldn't incite hate. So the whole thing is just an obvious attempt to, and it will be a successful attempt to completely clamp down on public conversation. And there is a real, I think people might not, um, who, you know, from this country might not understand how intensely woke and undemocratic and elitist the Irish political class is. I mean, they're, the, I think, the worst in Europe in relation to whether it's trans rights, green issues, any of the rest of it. There is such a kind of, uh, a, a, such a disregard for ordinary people's views. And, 
you know, the the outcome of all of this isn't going to be that I, that Irish people will just fall into line. But unfortunately, that there are going to be tensions. If we just give one example from, you know, in terms of how this isn't really actually about immigration necessarily, it's more about democracy. In a place where I'm from, it's a very rural area. It's, you know, there's no public transport. You know, you have to have a car and not very many jobs or anything like that. And has just had its, you know, Planning Commission Ireland is horrendous and takes a very, very long time. And after years of battle, I've got this funding for this uh, fire station and some uh, community centre and is overnight turned over to how modular housing for Ukrainian refugees. With and this is a you know a process which has gone through town hall meetings and council meetings and you know people have had their say in petitions, and you know people who are angry about that don't necessarily have any problem with a load of Ukrainian refugees. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. It's more uh, the feeling of you can't do that. You can't just snatch it away from us, having pretended like we're part of the conversation. Um, so you know there, are, I think that some of that is going to express itself in anti-immigrant sentiment. And unfortunately, that's the case for people who aren't actually really anti-immigrant. And the opportunists are going to have a great time because I think the more that the conversation has been driven underground, the less it's able to, for people who might have liberal views on immigration or have a more nuanced view on immigration, will get their say. And it's, again, that democratic point is so important because of the fact that there is such a disparity, either between the views of the public and what um, the politicians, or I saw one poll that said something like 75% of Irish people think that Ireland's taking too many refugees that's definitely not reflected in policy and it was something like 83 percent of Sinn Féin supporters so it's like it's the uh, it doesn't fit as neatly into the kind of uh into what might be going on in the commentary at any one time but it's so clear that whether it's in Ireland or in Britain or elsewhere this issue is one of the one of those issues which has become such a lightning rod for that feeling of not really having control over the laws which govern you not really being well looked after by your own government. And I think, and if you don't want that sentiment to set in doing things like um, creating um, certain public facilities that people have been waiting a long time for and a very hard one in countries where you could, it's very difficult to build absolutely anything. And then without any consultation, just overnight turning that over to refugee provision, you're going to create some sort of backlash. Um, and that is so crystal clear at this point. And Going back to that far right question, as I say, this it's ridiculous to dismiss all of this as just being puppeteered by the far right or whatever. But you do not want to be in a situation where the only people willing to go there are those people who are willing to say, I hear you. They should be doing something about it. They are lying to you. But that is precisely what seems to be happening time and time and time again. Um, one would hope that these governments weren't going to replicate that mistake so soon after, you know. It felt like we'd already gone through that cycle, but it seems like that's where we're going at the moment, definitely. So for our final topic for today, um, you have to return to the trans issue, I'm afraid. And um, specifically about Rosie Duffield. So obviously Rosie Duffield, Labour MP, has become famous as a champion of uh, sex-based women's rights. Um, she's constantly sticking her neck out for having gender-critical opinions. Um, and somewhat bizarrely, she's now been accused of anti-Semitism for liking a sort of a jokey gender critical tweet by Graham Linehan, who was criticizing Eddie Azard for essentially saying that um, if he was alive during the uh, the Holocaust, he would have been killed by the Nazis. We should say Linehan's joke because it was actually quite funny, which is, of course, the Nazis had a big problem with uh, <laughs> white men with blonde yeah, hair. White, or whatever, yeah, yeah. White, white straight men with blonde hair. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, apparently, yeah, liking this makes her anti This has been going on for quite some time. It's only just reached the news, I think. But the fact that it was instigated by one Ash Sarker, mm. I think, tells you everything about how shamelessly political all of this is. Not least because of the fact that Rosie Duffield was one of those Labour MPs who was very vocal and concerned about the anti-Semitism in the Labour Party under Corbyn issue. So the idea that she's some Holocaust revisionist, which is what the charge that Ash Sarker essentially levelled at her door, or was endorsing Holocaust revisionism at all. It's so shameless, it's almost difficult to understand why it's being taken seriously at all. But unfortunately, this is just the situation. I think if Labour's got any sense, they should, the leadership that is, they should take this as an opportunity to almost quite ostentatiously <laughs> stand by Rosie Duffield. But given what's happened during this witch hunt every step of the way to, to this point, there's no 
prospect of that, it doesn't seem like. I'm not saying they'll get rid of her, but um, the they'll continue to let people just beat up on her until she's left the party. No, it's just like. trying to grind her down. I mean, Rosie mm. just can't catch a break at the moment. There is, you know, I think that, that you know, as much as the sort of momentum side of Labour when it was influential had this kind of, and people still hold on to the idea that the whole kind of anti-Corbyn thing and you know, discussion about anti-Semitism was a witch hunt and, oh, you were just so obsessed with him and blah, blah, blah. And they can't, can't see that that seems to be exactly what's happening with Rosie Duffield, apart from the fact that Rosie Duffield has never said anything that's anti-trans, never said anything to my knowledge that's anti-Semitic. In fact, and has been through this, um, you know, as we've written on spiked has been through this before in relation to sort of threats of disciplinary action and has had a, she's herself has admitted that she's got an incredibly hostile relationship with the labor leadership, you know, that they, you know, have refused, a lot of them have refused to speak to or apologize to her for what she's gone through. And it isn't a good look for a, uh, a, allegedly a government in waiting, as they like to call themselves for a party that a lot of people are thinking might win a next election when it comes. Um, that there has been a continuous and concerted effort to hound out a vocal woman from their party. And I'm, you know, I don't often do the kind of feminist line, but Christ, a woman who's talking about serious issues relating to women's freedom and, you know, is being pulled up for disciplinary action for the crime of liking something on Twitter. Even that, even the sort of absurdity of mm. the idea of liking, never mind that it's Graham Linehan, of simply liking a tweet is just ludicrous. Surely they're meant to be a party that's more serious than this. Yeah, absolutely. If we could just pivot slightly away, something even less serious, <laughs> um, and instead talk about Doctor Who briefly. The latest special aired over the weekend, um, and we were treated to the Doctor... Um, being lectured on the uh, perils of misgendering a alien. Um, <laughs> so there's this sort of big fluffy alien. I believe his name is Meep the Meep the Beep or Beep the Meep, some combination of those words. And the doctor foolishly assumed that this alien was a man, referred to it as he, and a um, trans character who is also played by a trans woman actress, um, delivered a delightful lecture to the Doctor about um, why we should never misgender people or aliens and that we should always ask for their pronouns. The doctor humbly accepted and said, yes, I'm so sorry. What are your pronouns? Um, I'm cringing just listening <laughs> to you. Yeah, it was incredibly ham-fisted and difficult to watch. It's like I made it up. Like, if you <laughs> yeah. had to kind of try to make up, oh, this show has gone woke, what are they going to do? Yeah. yeah. That's exactly what you would... But to, why, why are they doing this? Like, what what is this all well, about? Why is it this constant sort of need? It's Russell to... T Davies. I mean, he's got an axe mm. to grind, yeah. and okay, it's you know his show at this point, and he's writing it. Fair enough. I mean, I don't watch Doctor Who on principle because I'm not I'm, a child, I'm nerd. <laughs> um, but the sorry any viewers that that are fans, but there's. You know, that I think it's telling that it always has to. You can't. You just leave it alone. Yeah. Can't you just let it be? what it is. Why does it have yeah. to have this messaging? Actually, Malcolm Clark wrote a really interesting article on Spiked um, about this, where he you know, went into the fact that if you are a Doctor Who fan and you are, and you are interested in sci-fi, which I'm interested in, you know, there's quite an illustrious history of um, on TV and in books and fiction of this being a serious genre and that actually, you know, a, a long history of social commentary uh, you know, think about Brave New World or anything like that. And there is a, you know, the fact that it's come from those sort of heights of quite, quite, you know, interrogating kind of the politics of the time and actually a lot of the time quite serious left-wing ideology in sci-fi to now an alien being offended or someone being offended on an alien's behalf because they have been called he or she. You just think, oh, dear me. You know, the authors of the past must be turning in their grave what, You know, the, at the idea of this because it's such a descent into madness. It also, it seems to burnish this claim that, um, I remember Andrew Doyle said this many years ago, he was like, the thing about the work is they can't make art or culture. I was like, well, of course they do. They make it all the time. It's like you can't move for messages. He's like, no, but I mean, it's it kills all creativity because everything has to be put in second place to the message, to mm. the lecture, to the propaganda, what have you. And it's a perfect example of that. It's like it's creative death, mm. this stuff, not least because this is a movement that is so preoccupied with the messages in culture and whether or not they're standing on the right side of history or whether in 10 years hence someone will find this episode on BBC iPlayer and decide that one particular scene was actually unpleasant for X, Y, Z reason and demand that it be pulled down. So yes, if nothing else, proof that um, wokeness is creative death. 
this episode seems like a good example of it. Thank you so much for watching the Spikes podcast. We'll be back next Friday. If you hit subscribe and click the bell, you'll never miss an episode. And in the meantime, why not check out all of Spike's other videos and podcasts on this channel? And for more Spiked content, find us at spiked-online.com.